Thank you. So I think many of you have seen a set of slides that I have been sharing for a few weeks. I spoke at the Front Range Anthroposophical Cafe at the beginning of September and found myself talking about the fact that with these last few years that are a hundred years on from the life and work of Rudolf Steiner, we have esoterically speaking a rather special situation. Steiner um, told us many things which uh, are beyond verification for most of us, but I think most of us have developed a lot of confidence in what he said, and he indicated that 100 years is a significant time span, and 100 years after something important has been undertaken, it needs to be renewed, re-embraced, relaunched, hopefully carried to a higher level, or it just becomes historical. Um, Goethe died in 1832. In 1932, of course, everyone in Germany and the rest of Europe and America had heard his name, but his work was not really being carried forward. In fact, Germany was on a slippery slope into the abyss at that point. So here we are about to arrive at 2023. I'm gonna get my 19s and my 20s mixed up occasionally. But 2023, 100 years after the Gertianum building that Rudolf Steiner and his followers were building in Switzerland was set ablaze and not being adequately watched and protected, perhaps, and uh, burnt to the ground over New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, New Year's Day of 1923. And that followed with a year of real agonizing for Rudolf Steiner because he had old followers who joined up with him maybe in 1901 with the Theosophical Society. And he had new young followers after the disaster of the Great War, World War I, uh, who were excited about different things. The original group were excited about learning esoteric knowledge, learning deeper secrets, and carrying spiritual questions up to a level of um, awareness suitable for the 20th century and our scientific era. The young people wanted to do things. And after that war, Steiner had started doing things and we've been observing 100th anniversaries. They actually go back earlier to the calendar of the soul, the birth of Eurythmy, but then the first Waldorf school, 1919, the work on new social ideas, threefolding, the physician's initiative, anthroposophic medicine, uh, and a number of other things, pretty much the last of them being bio biodynamic agriculture in the last <clears throat> weeks in which Rudolf Steiner was able still to appear in public. So we're at the time when the hundred years has come around and hopefully we're going to find our way to reinforce what he brought, rediscover it, repurpose it perhaps, relaunch it, and make it a further force for another century. If we can and will do that, humanity will be the better for it. At least that's been my opinion for about 38 years now. We often ask each other how we came to anthroposophy, that's the phrase, how we came to anthroposophy. I was burnt out from three years in the city-owned WNYC public radio operation in New York, and the thought popped into my head that young people like myself and younger, I was 34 at the time, 
were pessimistic about the future of humanity and what reasons did they have not to be? So I thought, well, I'll write a book for the year 2000. That's 16 years away. Why not? Don't have any content, but that's long enough. And uh, went looking and uh, met a number of things. Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth by Buckminster Fuller, which is very much on that wavelength. Uh, the World Future Society, Eastern Religions, Shamanism, and Rudolf Steiner. So when I met Steiner, I said, I think this content is big enough. I started with occult science, which takes us back to the beginning of time. Um, it's really equivalent to the Big Bang of physics, except it explores all of those preceding stages as matters of consciousness rather than as physical events. So I said, I have maybe understood 1% of this book, but I know this guy has got a big enough imagination or understanding to supply a lot of information. And I went on and uh, spent seven or eight years reading him nonstop while working at the Chase Manhattan Bank, sitting in their, their lunchroom off Wall Street and uh, reading Rudolf Steiner. And uh, joining the New York branch in the 90s, we felt that we could make some kind of a breakthrough that somehow people didn't get who Steiner was. There are a lot of things we say. If you called him an educator and nothing else, people would know that he was an important person. If you called him a theologian, which I don't know anybody has, say, oh, he's a very significant theologian. Um, his agricultural impulse, that's really terribly important. and his work in the arts or as an architect. Architecture students know Rudolf Steiner, you may not know anything else about him, but oh, he did a couple of very important buildings. Yeah, you put it all together and he kind of disappears because you don't have words for who has that kind of imagination that can be inspirational and then even practical. He built, uh, he, he designed the second Gertianum, which I think of Frank Gehry and uh, some of the computer helped things of the last few decades. Uh, he did it out of a huge slab of plasticine, whatever that is. I'm looking at Lucian in the back of the aisle here. <clears throat> but, uh, and it stood up. It works. It inspires. It's magnificent. It's also made out of concrete rather than the first one's wood because he needed to recognize the opposition to what he was doing. So I'm going to get into, into the main subject here in a second, but there is tremendous opposition to this. He helped us understand that. When we talk in scientific material terms, we talk essentially of things. And since our culture has become dominated by that consciousness, we think of ourselves more and more as things. Because we think of ourselves as things, it's not too hard to think of ourselves as expendable. It's a new thing in the Atlantic Monthly I just saw yesterday about, you know, there's really movement we're gonna be extinct and that's okay, coming from several different directions. Those thoughts are out there. When you think about consciousness rather than matter, you end up having to think about beings. Well, we are beings, we do have consciousness. We kind of lost touch with a lot of the other consciousness except for our companion animals. But when you begin to push your consciousness back out and imagine that we're part of something much, much larger, as we believed in earlier millennia, then you begin to understand maybe there's something big going on that we're part of, and maybe there are 
beings whose consciousness is too large to imagine being in a human body and doesn't even need a body, who are pushing and pulling things and inclining us one way or another, inclining us to try to get out of this mess on the earth or to try to take it over and toughen it up or just to abandon the whole thing. And these are part of the testing, the training of what we are capable of becoming, which has actually come out of the New Age movement more than I've heard from anthroposophists, the term co-creators. We've certainly changed the earth a lot, not always in such desirable ways, but we have demonstrated at a low physical level a tremendous capacity to change things. Are we perhaps on a path that we don't know about? Although the ideas are popping up. Is there perhaps an actual spirit of the times who's encouraging us and helping us imagine possibilities that uh, we don't notice when we're looking down at our cell phones and uh, amusing ourselves to death in the phrase from Neil Postman some decades ago. So all of that background, and I found myself moving into and trying to serve the anthroposophical movement and society, and I reached the end of six Jupiter cycles. We'll throw in a little of that here and found that suddenly I felt my original impulse again. And I felt that we need as human beings to have all of us of all ages reasons to believe in ourselves again, in our potential, and in a larger reality of which we are part. And then I started looking at Rudolf Steiner again, and now you can finally give us a second page and, uh, and discovered that Rudolf Steiner was talking about changing culture, changing civilization. He did it repeatedly. And so I'm talking here now about the challenge of 2023. Would it be good for us to think, try to think on the scope that Rudolf Steiner was accustomed to thinking on? Now, we have to recalibrate, refocus to decide, I believe, uh, that Rudolf Steiner's central initiative was, you could say it was bringing the understanding of reincarnation and karma. You could say it was bringing anthroposophy, but then you have to go define that. He said that word should be understood as the consciousness of one's humanity or of one's human condition because he used a particular German term for humanity, Menschentum. And uh, he said a lot of significant things. And while other people took up education, took up agriculture, took up the priest training, took up the medicine, took up eurythmy, took up speech, there wasn't anybody to take up culture, civilization. And he knew perfectly well that it was a global civilization that we would be creating now and are creating. And when you create a global civilization, if it doesn't have hopeful content, meaningful, powerful, realistic content about the human being in it, what are we doing here? So it seems to me that uh, you could... You could even say that his central initiative was humanity. Now, in 23, he spent the year trying to figure out how to go forward. The young people didn't want to be involved with the old people. He set up a second anthroposophical society. Uh, he continued doing all the amazing lectures and, and work with different groups and different initiatives. And he invited people then to come representing countries at the end of the year to found a new anthroposophical society. And 
we all, I think, have gotten used to carrying some real reverence for the Christmas Foundation Conference and the great mantra about the nature and situation of the human being, which is at the heart of that conference. He also gave the guidance for how to set up or how the society should be run and that the society would be supporting a school. He had done esoteric schooling before, but this was a new form. These things are in statutes. We repeat them with uh, some frequency. And, you know, it's crept up on me very slowly, realizing that nobody else could take up his strategic ideas about culture and civilization. There's just nobody to do it. There are people for everything else. He talked to Albert Schweitzer. Schweitzer understood him. They exchanged some nice communications. And Schweitzer said, yeah, it's about culture. But I had my own path on that. But um, a second understanding was these statutes, which we take as a very definite guidance, leave out one thing. Rudolf Steiner was present. He was active along with them. Without him, they change. They did not describe a society without Rudolf Steiner, without a working leadership group, and the leadership group stopped working within weeks after his death and exploded in 1935. Without Rudolf Steiner, those statutes cannot be taken as the Ten Commandments. And the new mysteries are not about following commandments anyway. They're about imagining and going to meet the future, doing our best effort and learning from the success and failure of those efforts. So... I would suggest we also need to pry ourselves loose from too slavish an adherence to those statutes. We should understand what they meant in that context and shift them according to the change of context. Rudolf Steiner never repeated things by rote. Why should we? The other thing we have to do is gain insight into our times. Steiner observed himself that uh, his students and adherents knew quite a bit or were at least aware of Lycurgus, who was the lawgiver of Sparta, but they didn't necessarily know that much about a lot of things happening in their own contemporary world. He had mentioned Lycurgus, so Lycurgus had become part of what Anthroposophus knew about, being a pretty close-knit group at the time. We need to look up and see what's going on. Enormous things have changed. Does Anthroposophy change with them? If Anthroposophy is the consciousness of one's human condition, of all our human conditions, it needs to be as dynamic as the times. So then we get to what we might actually have to do. First necessities is the item on this little overview list. The Gertianum is a university of higher knowledge of kind of unlimited potential dimensions. And it has, I don't know, Christopher, um, maybe 10 million euros a year operating budgets, something in that region. The, uh, I'm living in Ann Arbor now, and Michigan has 28 community colleges, and it appropriates an average of a bit more than that for each of Michigan's 28 community colleges. We cannot imagine as wonderful as the Gertianum and everything that goes on there is, we cannot imagine 
that that was adequate for what Rudolf Steiner wanted us to carry forward. If it had a hundred times that budget, it would not that you don't need the people and the inspiration and all of the real qualities to go with that, but if it had a completely different level of resources, um, the civilization of the whole world would be different. Today, nobody in the world has to take account of the Gertianum. That should be shocking to all of us. We do so many accommodations with evil today as a matter of course. I don't think we could do that if all the possibilities of human love and genius and community were being explored and researched and made manifest in the way that they could be. And it's not that, you know, a billion dollar budget for the Gertianum is out of the question. We just spent 16 to $17 billion for the federal and state level elections of 2022 in the United States. $16.7 billion on elections. And if you think about the weight, I mean, there was a lot of weight on this. It's part of the reason there was so much money. But we're doing it just because there is so much resource in the world, so much money, so much power through that money that enormous numbers of people are chasing it and are willing to put up a lot to try to get it. And other people are willing to try to keep things out in a shared community, small d democratic situation. But that's the kind of money that's floating around. The Anthroposophical Society in America, where I've been working for 12 years, has done many wonderful things with a tiny, tiny budget. It's about $850,000 operating funds this year. Um, the Michigan Animal Rescue League has about twice that income and doesn't even spend it all, puts a good chunk of it away every year. And they don't serve the whole state, they serve one county. One county of one state for looking out for lost and abused animals has a good bit more of a budget than the national organization trying to support the consciousness of our human situation. So building resources just should never be off the table. And in a few days, you know, it's, it's not the same angle, but then a few days from Chicago here, you know, economic consciousness is tremendously important. And we have people working on that. And Christopher Houghton Bud will be speaking face to face, not on Zoom, but here in Chicago. And that's very important. The fundamental question, we do not have enough. What do we do about that? So the next item, path of success. We have to be part of this culture we're in. That's what I mean by cultural accessibility. And we have to adapt as things change. Rudolf Steiner pointed out to us that he uses the word Araman. We could use the word Satan. Satan gave us printing. And uh, so we could say, oh my gosh, can't use any book that isn't handwritten. But of course, that's absurd. <laughs> but you have to understand, you know, I was in 
radio stations. We were electrifying talk and music and ideas. We were playing recordings all day long. It can easily be deadening. You have to add some of your own energy in to bring it back to life. And if you can actually have it coming to you live and then meet it with your own life, well, then magical things begin to happen. As in a school where the uh, curriculum is not canned and prescribed and monitored by bureaucrats and politicians. So adapting the new media is part of my reason for waking up at this point. If the challenge has been to get the word out about anthroposophy farther than it's gone, I'm the one who didn't get that done in the last 12 years, or at least I had the title. But a year ago, I finally, you know, so I was in this work, nonprofits and communications up through 2005. And a year ago, I encountered a training, which has been going on 25 years now for using the new media and really just basically email and building relationships through email and using the internet and so forth and video to connect with people and to find out what would be transformative in their lives and find out how they express that. The one thing I think I did in the last 12 years was the title of our publication, Being Human. Anybody can see that and say, oh, well, that might have something to do with me. I'll take a look at it. If it had been anthroposophy in America, you know, yeah, <laughs> um, you might pick up an angling machine, uh, magazine or a popular mechanics or anthroposophy in America, but being human has a different something. And so reaching out to people, building your connections with them is a systematic thing. And tens of thousands of people are doing it successfully on an individual basis. Now, the anthroposophical movement, I'm just talking about the USA and North America has this incredible intellectual capital, all these ideas. And the thing about them is that we have a certain sense that they're being part of consciousness, they're beings rather than things. And so at our best, we can work with ideas in more interesting ways than is generally expected. And then the human beings, anthroposophists and people connected with all of this are very interesting people. They may not be tuned to world changing or culture making, but they're very serious about things that are not generally carried very seriously in the rest of humanity. And, uh, you know, these are big resources. We may be short of money. We've got tremendous ideas. We've got tremendous people. 4,500 members for the ASA is a very small number in one way, but it's an amazing resource if it could be marshaled to, to uh, develop things, you know, along new lines, building connections, reaching out, and finding new ways to talk to people. So I ended this little uh, report. I made it a report from 2033 because when you say we could do this and we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this. Steiner talked about you know this and we need to do it. People don't really love to be pushed. And I realized I'd never seen a picture. Well, Steiner talks about the sixth epoch. That's... Uh, 1400 years away now. Uh, it's inspiring, but it's a little distant. But 2033 is something many of us can expect to experience. 
and to imagine that these ideas, these impulses, maybe with new language, were reaching people and engaging people and drawing in resources for the research and the work that could be done for the best possibilities of humanity. That's more of a poll. That's more like, you know, the medieval knights going on adventure. And after all, what is adventure? Adventure, like the word culture, like the word future. They're old Latin future participles. The future is what will be. Culture is what is to be cultivated. And adventure is what's coming toward us. Well, a lot is coming toward us. The knights of old used to imagine going out and meeting them head on. Okay. okay, this is what's coming. I'm not sure whether it's a monster or a friend. I'm going to go find out. So that's why I made a report from 2033. Now, I've kind of gone free form here rather than simply go through these slides, but let's step through them pretty quickly. And the invitation for this for Zoom, um, you probably got an email and it has links to this, so you could look at these. But if you'll give me the next slide here, Andre. I've added a few quotes to the original thing from Rudolf Steiner, but this was there from the beginning. A society such as ours has to act as a vanguard in an ever wider disseminating of those elements so needed under the conditions that prevail today. Those who became anthroposophists were the first to feel what millions and millions of others will be feeling keenly indeed in a not too distant future, that older forms no longer provide what the modern human's inner life requires and the dignity of full humanness demands. Those last words are, I find a little hard to wake up in 2022. So much has been poured out and so much of it is junk. But when you get to phrase the dignity of full humanness, it's like an unfamiliar melody. You need to wake it up and really hear it and really take it in and feel it. But that's what Rudolf Steiner was about, the dignity of full humanness. Next slide. I'm going to go very quickly over these and the different types. So the first realization is this is a moment we need to seize if we're going to draw on the power that Rudolf Steiner left behind him. It's a chance to carry forward his work rather than let it go and let it become history. And the questions that come out of it, well, what was his intention and what has kept us from achieving it? So I've argued his mission was culture, but you could also say it was humanity. And we could have a nice conversation about what is culture or what is civilization. And, you know, one thing written on a subway wall I saw decades ago was culture is all the ways you are. So don't ever let anyone tell you that you don't have any culture. Culture is like the placenta. I don't hear that talked about much anymore. The Egyptians had a nice hieroglyph of the placenta. It connects between the individual and humanity, or a larger group, and now ultimately all of humanity. So culture is a mystery in itself, and uh, maybe the general section of the school could take that question up. Just 
how does it work? How do we work with it? A second thing I hadn't mentioned is that at Steiner's death, he had two Im most important supporters, Marie von Sievers Steiner, whom he had married in 1915, who had been with him from the beginning of the theosophical work. She was his trusted advisor. She was his good judgment. She could question things and he would really hear and value what she brought. Ida Wegman had joined early on, but developed more slowly. She had a longer karmic history with Rudolf Steiner, with the individual who was then Rudolf Steiner, and he valued her for initiative. When she wanted to bring uh, her medical practice to nearby the Gertianum uh, in the early 1920s, he'd said, when she asked, well, I can't advise you about that. Oh, really? <laughs> and so she went and did it. And then when she held the opening and showed him the new facility and they got up to the top floor, he said, you have pencil and paper. I'd like to write the uh, publicity for this. <laughs> so it's clear that uh, he might have been hoping for something, but he expected her to take initiative. The third thing I did mention is we leave Rudolf Steiner out of the picture. We cannot forget, and this is the kind of thing like the Sherlock Holmes story about the dog who didn't bark. Well, the dog was there, something happened, dreadful, and the dog didn't bark. Well, the dog must have known the person who was the perpetrator, okay? Rudolf Steiner was there. He gave us all this incredible stuff. He ceased to be there physically. We don't make an inquiry into the significance and the possible necessity to reform certain things because he was no longer there. Another quote, this is from Peter Selg's sixth volume of his seven volume biography. Steiner noted, it will not be viable if things continue as before. He was saying this in 1923, suggesting that the society needed to be suffused with the quote, will to wake up because then it can inspire an awakening of the present civilization as a whole. If he'd said this about beekeeping, we'd have all been talking about it for all these decades. But civilization has been larger than the perspective we could bring to it. He devoted, this is Peter Selg, he devoted the remainder of 1923, indeed his life, to that cause. So when we look around, I would say you could call socialism a cultural movement. It's political, it's uh, economic, it's, but it's a, it's a cultural movement. Marx's efforts were cultural efforts. Um, Adam Smith, cultural effort, um, capitalism, you know, Culture is involved in a whole bunch of things which we don't think of as culture. But what cultural initiative do we, religions, they're all cultural initiatives, or you can call them civilizations. The clash of civilizations is kind of the blueprint for the Western power elite since the fall of the Berlin Wall. That's a book by a Harvard professor, The Clash of Civilizations. We're going to have to spend the next thousand years fighting with people because we're Western 
Christians and their Orthodox or their Islam or their Confucian or their Hindu, and we'll leave Africa out of it entirely. Um, there are cultural ideas out there. Artificial intelligence will surpass the human being and will make better judgments than we can make. And Elon Musk said a few years will be like a house cat when artificial intelligence reaches its potential and it will be reinforcing and developing itself then. That's a cultural idea. That isn't a fact. Anthroposophy is another cultural idea. It's an astounding cultural idea. If you think the Renaissance was a good thing, what do you think anthroposophy is? <laughs> I'm preaching, I guess, to the converted, but I don't hear us talking this way. And Steiner's assertion, we're the vanguard for millions and millions. We also have information from Steiner about how Asia and the east of Europe are different from the center of Europe and are different from West Europe, I think particularly the British Isles and North America. We in the society in the United States have not done a lot to try to understand what it is specifically to be the anthroposophical society in the United States of America. Now, you think about anthroposophy springing up in kindergartens and schools by the dozens in China. You think, well, of course, things have to be adapted to China. Well, things have to be adapted to the United States also. There are different things at the level of geographical ethers. You know, Central Europe, all of Europe is, uh, is what the uh, fluid ether, the water ether. Far east is the air ether. The west coast, we've got two. The west side of the Rockies is the fire ether, and the east side is the solid or the earth ether. In New York, you better say, I want the facts. And in Los Angeles, it's okay to say, I like your energy. We also are the place of mechanization of the mysteries of death and of the cosmic power we call will. We're about doing things and will is about the future. And if we don't grasp our piece of the puzzle, Europe much more about relationships, about healing, about understanding each other, about how you work with each other. The Far East conception, both biological and in the level of ideas. We have to understand our place in the world. We also, in looking at these new media, which have just exploded on us, it's, it's just a few decades and they occupy most of our attention most of the time. It's a slight exaggeration, but yeah. And don't start doing TikTok until you're ready for it. It's addictive. Little warning to the wise. Uh, it was originally imagined that all this internet stuff was going to be good because it began with the idea, I've got something on my big academic server or on my research computer how could i share that with you and do you have something you could share with me it was amazing social impulse and the vision of all this was very very good and then all kinds of human beings got involved with all kinds of motives and with no established paths and you know nothing nothing it was clear that if you did that it was unacceptable you know no limits were clearly defined and maybe they shouldn't be 
But so it's something wonderful that turned poisonous. We need to remember the wonderfulness and use that. Books can be horrific. Books can be sublime. The new media can be either, and we need to use it in the way that serves human dignity. Steiner quoted again by Peter Selg, try to become one with the world. That will be the best and most important, air quotes, program. It is something that cannot be contained in statutes, but needs to burn in our hearts as a flame. So the society necessarily has been planning based on the kinds of funds it has had available, the American society, I'm sure the Gertianum, planning only on the scarcity you have predetermines your expectations way too much. That's why a report from 2033 occurred to me. What if we got past the financial stranglehold to plan to really achieve this incredible mission. Now, Karl Marx's inheritors radically changed the world. And that's also true of the people who read Adam Smith and many others. The world has been changed culturally. People simply had to believe in what they were doing. And those ideas had to have significant force and applicability to them. I believe our ideas in this movement have lots of good power, empowering power rather than enforcing power and are hugely, hugely applicable. And we're demonstrating it in so many ways. There are other spiritual movements, so-called, some of them have some schools. Catholic Church has a lot of schools. Some of them are into nutrition, maybe, or health a little. Some of them do some arts. The complex of things in anthroposophy are extraordinary and unique. We're credible. We need to build on that. So building up adequate resources is going to involve what? reaching people with what we imagine can be done and engaging them, forming community with them, maybe multiple communities. And one of the key things will be to understand an outside as well as an inside to this movement. Here's another quote. This is uh, Rudolf Steiner being quoted by Henry Barnes, our longtime general secretary. I am convinced that we could succeed in achieving in five or 10 years what will now take us 50 or 75. We would need 50 or 75 million francs, then we would probably be able to do the work in a tenth of the time. This was uh, remarks in front of a morning talk on the next to last day of the Christmas Foundation Conference, and Henry Barnes adds, it is clear that the same line of thought applies equally to the fields of the arts, of education, agriculture, social life, etc." Home Rudolf Steiner did not say, make it work homeopathically with a tiny fraction of the resources anybody else would need. He said, with the right resources, you could move this forward really fast. So I've mentioned this, our other kinds of resources, the ideas, the people, the initiatives. The initiatives give us credibility. We don't, you know, 
we don't need to be kind of in this defensive posture. No, Rudolf Steiner wasn't a white supremacist. No, he wasn't a racist. If we are putting forward all the good things that are being accomplished without whitewashing any of our mistakes or shortcomings, which are more ours, I think, than Rudolf Steiner's in many cases, um, we'll be fine. People just aren't hearing from us. Another quote, the time will not fail to come when the anthroposophic way of thinking will spread in ever widening circles. And in measure as it does so, people will take the right practical steps to affect social progress. Not until now could a world conception with the prospect of this kind of practical result be communicated to all and every person. One must recognize that anthroposophy has still to expand and grow to the full height of its cultural mission. He said that in an essay in 1906. And I think he hoped at least that the development of European civilization would provide a place for anthroposophy to be added on top of it. And if you look at the arts and the sciences before the Great War, before 1914, say, oh yeah, wow, <laughs> look at all of that. And if you come back in 1920, even the children of the victors the children of the British or the French or the Americans are saying, you know, why did you get us involved in this? Wasn't this supposed to end war? Wasn't this supposed to have some high purpose? You betrayed us. And that rift between the generations in Europe discredited Europe as a world leader. It staggered on through a second war and into the 60s but the power basically ended up with the United States and Russia, which back in 1920 had not been culturally competent to be world leaders. By 1960, they were it. So Steiner's argument here is that he's brought something and he doesn't credit himself that can change the world. There we go. So the cultural accessibility, our languaging and our messaging are very hidebound. We need to start thinking of what we're doing, not in terms of the extraordinary guidance we've gotten from Rudolf Steiner and others, but on the transformation that these things create for the human beings who receive them or engage in them. You know, Waldorf has done a pretty good job of that kind of messaging. The rest of our movement, eh, not so much. The core initiative that is anthroposophy, we don't even treat it as an initiative. We treat it as a possession to be held on to. So the transfer, for example, um, Carmen reincarnation, the life every one of us lives seems pretty big when we're young. It begins to get a little tighter depending on our circumstances. And by my age, you say, okay, well, half the people my age I know, or at least the men have dropped dead by now. Um, how would I... How would I feel my prospects? How would I feel the importance of living if I didn't have a sense that this is one life and I don't know if I'll get any of my dreams accomplished, but I will have changed. <clears throat> I will not be the same person. My mother who spent her last 30 years 
in pain, paralyzed in a wheelchair, she took will out of this lifetime. She's going to be somebody in the next lifetime. She's not a pathetic cripple with a destroyed life. She's somebody who developed as a human spirit very powerfully. I hope I can do a fraction as much. Once we think of, okay, life is like this. Consciousness is where we really live. It's all different. Transformative. That's a transformative offering. That's a core of anthroposophy. And the Pew Research Organization, one of the most credible, says 37% of Americans believe in karma and reincarnation or believe in reincarnation today, down from 55% a few years ago. 37% would be roughly 100 million people. 100 million people, we can't find some people interested in what we're doing out of 100 million people with the new media to reach them for pennies, whereas 40 years ago, it would have been a $100 million advertising campaign. Adapting to new contexts, cultural, artistic expectations. Well, I'm very knowledgeable from my public radio work about European and American classical music, so-called. I wish I knew a lot more about all the popular music. I know way too little, and it takes a lot of consciousness to take in something like that. But isn't there maybe something going on there? I mean, we see some peaks, we see some exceptional things coming out of it. We don't have the resources to look into it. We don't have any paid support for the sections of the School for Spiritual Science in North America, except for where they've raised money directly themselves. And that's only a couple of them. We also just need this inward and outward. The old mystery centers had an inside the temple and they had an outside the temple. They acted in both places. What they did outside pretty much became what we call religion. What they did inside, we knew very, very little about until people like Rudolf Steiner finally decided, okay, you're ready to know about this now. You're ready to know that Christianity wasn't just, you know, something that popped out of nowhere. It involved a betrayal of the mysteries in public and a culmination of the mysteries. And uh, it brought the power for people to become individuals, which had begun with Moses in the burning bush, who said its name is I am that I am. Yeah, Steiner's brought theology to religion, which is the toughest case because their theologies have all gotten attached to their sects and their organizations. And independent theology is one more tremendously powerful thing we have in our arsenal. So growing our contacts, building our email lists, um, improving our online techniques, we can make beautiful art on electronic devices. It's gonna be a challenge, but we do amazing stuff with, with uh, charcoal and paper with watercolor, which is not the first thing people think of as fine art material. Uh, designing the paths of engagement to meet people where they are, understand what will change their lives, help them change their lives, and communicate how we could contribute to that and building long-term relationships, communities of interest, which don't need to be membership in the society. It's just fine if they're not memberships. People who are attracted to what is specifically in the society and in the school, 
will be nearby then and they'll be finding it. They'll join us, but we don't have to make that a prerequisite that they're going to be members and members of the school. Steiner again, for the time being, anthroposophy must couch the message it has to deliver in language suited to a particular group of people. This is 196 again. Later, it will again find suitable terms in which to speak to other circles also. Nobody whose mind is not rooted in hard and fast dogmas can suppose that the form in which the anthroposophic message is delivered today is a permanent or by any means the only possible one. So he anticipated that and he demonstrated it in many ways, but yeah. So the next slides, I may leave more to uh, tomorrow afternoon Zoom session. This is a picture of how we actually supposedly got from 2023 to 2033. But uh, yeah, there are steps. They can be laid out very specifically. They are manageable. It takes focus. It takes calling on people to step up as volunteers. It takes flexibility. It takes planning. But the goal, to say the goal is worth it is for me an enormous understatement. It's, it's essential to the life of humanity. We are going to go through, Rudolf Steiner said, if the anthroposophical movement doesn't reach a culmination at the end of the century, meaning by the year 2000, we will stand at the grave of civilization and the war of all against all. So if you think of people, everybody being out for themselves, and civilization being something that is basically full of decay and rot and sickness. Well, there's that picture of the frog that never jumps out of the pot it's being boiled in because the change in temperature is gradual. Are we living in a nice, healthy, clean, blessed, civilization? Are people really working together? It's actually interesting because Rudolf Steiner said the spiritual being who inspired this work since 1879 has been the time spirit, the archangel who rises to a level where that being can communicate to all of humanity at once. And we'll be doing that for roughly 300 years. So we find all the rottenness and all the self-serving, and we find counter efforts. We find people putting things together. We find people aiming higher, people cleaning things up, people demonstrating, as a poet put it, that generosity of spirit does not fail. So we've got two pictures. And some other wise people suggested this century would be Manichaean, in which the intense experience of good and evil, you know, would be very much with all of us. Maybe that's where we're at. But let's not be frogs in the pot. <coughs> I don't know if everyone can read this, but uh, there, there are steps. And we can, we can maybe go into this tomorrow. Stage three, the next one. People want to do something 
at this time. And it doesn't mean that anybody can do a lot. Some people might, some people could do only a tiny bit. Some people could only take the thought and the questions and live with it and carry it as they say in their hearts because that makes a difference too. But people want to do something. Passivity grows on itself. We don't want to be passive. Steiner said in 1924, people who've come to this movement want to be people of initiative. They do hold back because they realize that where they, the expression he gave, plant their sting, you know, like the bees who only have one sting, you know, okay, that's it. Things are going to bounce back on me. But people want to do things. And there are ways that other people are doing crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, collaborations, joint ventures. There are a lot of things that we haven't tried that are well-established, well-developed. You can understand how to do them in a matter of weeks. So here's a picture of how things went. From 100,000 people on our mailing list, that's about where we are now, to 30,000 in 2025 and 150,000 today in 2033. A class holder who was uh, many years high up in a, in a very large nonprofit organization said, this is good except that uh, that should be a million and a half, not 150,000. And with the quality of things we have to offer and the centrality of many of them, like the meaning of life, you know, I think he's right. I just didn't want to sound too far-fetched. New paths of engagement. Yeah. There's a real social opportunity in this when we are with people who already know a lot of what we know, you know, you get tremendous things out of a simple study group, six unprepossessing people with a volume of Steiner going week by week, people bring up things you never thought of. People make observations, recognize a thought you didn't notice. When we can take that out beyond our groups, there's going to be a further thing. There's going to be a tremendous leavening of what we've done. And that for me is what the second hundred years is about. Is not simply to intensify or amplify what we've built more inwardly, but to let the loaf rise. Next. So this is what was at the beginning. A society such as ours has to act as a vanguard in an ever wider disseminating of those elements so needed under the conditions that prevail today. Those who became anthroposophists were the first to feel what millions and millions of others will be feeling keenly indeed in a not too distant future that older forms no longer provide what the modern human being's inner life requires and the dignity of full humanist demands. February 13th, 1923, not quite two weeks after the Gertianum became ashes. Now, at the end of the 20th century, when we had a little bit of a culmination, but uh, not quite what Rudolf Steiner had been hoping for. Some people who did uh, research for companies and organizations was originally called lifestyle research in the 70s and 80s. It was called psychographic research by the 90s. 
these people published a little book called The Cultural Creatives, how I don't remember as 40 million or 50 million people are changing the world. So in the same lecture of 1923 of Steiner's, he talks about how you become an anthroposophist. And he says that normally our growing up attunes us to the world around us. Our world gets directed out here. But it can happen that you realize this isn't right. And that will turns in and you say, what's going on? And then becoming an anthroposophist, you find your way to North Lincoln. What's the address here? <laughs> For you, 49 North Lincoln Avenue in Chicago or other locations, or maybe just somebody sitting across from you on the commuter train or somebody in a Zoom group or a whatever. And you find out that they might have shared that feeling and they know some things. So first the feeling, your will turns in and your heart hurts. Second, say, oh, there are things to understand this. And then third, well, now that I understand, I can do things. What did this book about the cultural creative say, beginning with chapter two on how you become a cultural creative? It said your heart hurts as you see things are not right in the world. You go looking for answers and then you go looking for what you can do. Hmm. 40 or 50 million people, they discerned operating there in a space between traditionalists, old time religion, you know, tradition and place in the family and, you know, values are more important than money. Wow. And moderns, you say, oh, it's, a, you know, women need to have their place. And, um, you know, success is really important. And in the middle, values are important, individual opportunities are important, uh, and the life of the earth, the environment, the greenness is crucial. That's the group they identified as the cultural creatives. So we can assume they're there and um, in fact, we're dealing now with some cohorts we call millennials and Gen Z. And by some accounts, there's a little group of five or six years who didn't get a label. They're in there somewhere between the millennials and the Gen Z. And my experience is that there's a real difference of consciousness with people this these <clears throat> ages from the nephews and nieces I knew in the 80s or my own group who arrived in the early middle 60s. They are children of the generation in which the new age movement happened, in which the women's movement grew, in which a great many things on behalf of the individual came about. They aren't perfect. They got a lot of new mind. Are we gonna ignore that as anthroposophists? All right, let's, uh, I think we have one more. Well, a beacon of confidence in humanity in 2023. Could we be that? Could we be a beacon of confidence in humanity? We're not gonna have our problems solved. The weather in 2033 may be appalling. The suffering as a result of that and as a result of continued economic manipulations may be dreadful the abuse of free speech, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But is that our destination? Is that what humanity really is? Rudolf Steiner said that 
humanity or the human being is the religion of the gods. That the beings of higher consciousness have focused all their hope and potential into what we are capable of being. I hope we'll be that beacon of confidence. And the thing that really inspired Rudolf Steiner was this little story of Goethe's written in the years when all kinds of people were refugees in Europe because armies were marching back and forth. French Revolution had happened and this guy Napoleon came along and wielded enormous military power all the way to Moscow and all the way back. Uh, and a whole lot of ordinary people were in the way. So Goethe had these stories of German refugees. And in them, a priest tells the group a little fairy tale, or it's the best we can do for it in English, called The Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily. And it ends up with this idea that to the present hour, the bridge, the bridge that has been built. You might say it's the bridge from the conscious to the unconscious or from the physical world to the world of higher consciousness, the spiritual world, is swarming with travelers and the temple is the, the most frequented on the whole earth. Now, I have not once I got going, left a lot of room for comments, and we're already at 8.27 in the central time zone. I think we can stop that screen share. And uh, how about if we have comments, thoughts? Let's see if we can handle that. We've got a little, we had to do some work on our setup because my computer wouldn't plug well, into the right thing. I already have some idea, but looks like it's a little late. Does anybody here uh, phones? Do you have? Because I, I feel we have to plug something. It's going to be no echo. Yeah, we can. Oh, maybe we can use it. Okay, okay, dear friends, friends so we're we'll moving to, to questions, questions and answers, answers uh, section. And um, yeah, there is a, a button named reactions in the end of your screen. So if you click on it, oh, I see you, you, Barbara, you, 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 you're raising physical hands. So, so there is virtual, you know, uh, it's a big button, raise a hand. So go to emotions and there. Physical hands in this room also. But physical, physical hands, hands will work. work. Okay. okay. Barbara, Barbara, she was first. Barbara, Barbara Cousins. Uh, sorry, a little unorthodox, just yeah, raised my hand. But I am very encouraged by what you said, um, John, and I feel that you've given us a lot more courage than I usually get from anthroposophical lectures because normally we look inwards and we sort of think about how to explain all this to other people. But you're giving us this idea that we can just meet them where they are, be who we are, and things will grow from there. And I think that, you know, this is the mood of the time. It is different. And um, even Prince Charles, you know, or he's now the king, uh, he met with, um, uh, what was his name, that South African uh, in the desert, uh, Lawrence van der Post, mm -hmm. he met with him and he got a lot of his ideas, which were like a little crucible because they've grown. And I don't think he had a lot of time with Lawrence. I know they were great friends and they wrote to each other, but they only had about two nights in the Botswana desert. And he changed his life because all of his dynamic uh, biodynamic farming has stemmed from that. So yes, you are really giving me a lot of inspiration. I keep thinking of all the opportunities we have in the day to just be who we are and see who other people are and find that connection. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I think the people on Zoom heard that. I leaned over and heard it faintly and the people in the room didn't, but uh, you were recounting, I believe, how Prince Charles met Lawrence Vanderpost and then two nights in the desert in South Africa gained a, a new perspective for his life. And yeah, I think we can do that. I think every one of us has inspiration to share and imaginations. Yeah. Here's comment in the room. Well, I was, well, I'll just say, I was a little confused when you said that Steiner was, I can't directly quote what you said, uh, either hoping or wanted uh, humanity to be what we could be. And my confusion is, is that all you have to do is look around and you'll see what humanity is. What is going to happen in the future? So I imagine he's saying what it could be in a positive sense. But yeah. what it is, is exactly what we are. We're not, it's, it's not a mystery. People do good mm -hmm. things, people do bad things, there's a war, people still kill each other. Uh, I think, you know, when you talk about the youth now, and the Gen, Gen Zs, millennials, well, Mary and I have six kids, and they're disappointed. But people of our age or older call them, well, they feel entitled. I think they, they are entitled to the things that we told them humanity is supposed to be. You're supposed to be good. You're not supposed to be a jerk. Why wouldn't they be disappointed? So the future came to them and they said, holy crap, you know, this is what it really is because I can see. You know, Russia invaded Ukraine. All this stuff that Jesus said and Moses said, we know forever and forever, but nobody cares. So, I mean, <laughs> so let me, I don't know that people on Zoom could hear much of that, but it was the observation that um, what humanity is, is visible all around us and there's the good and the bad. And I think it's a difficulty in seeing what exactly is going to make that change. And one example of the language question that I want to work with people tomorrow morning in person here about is that in Anthropos, we know about something or we have from Steiner, the evolution of consciousness. Okay, that's a wonderful concept. You can go all kinds of places with it and it doesn't communicate in general. Evolution of consciousness, well, uh, who studies that? Uh, let's see, that would be... Uh, cultural anthropologists, uh, it's somebody as uh, some specialist. No, we don't want to say there's an evolution of consciousness. We want to say that humanity has its own evolution in addition and in distinction from what we know from Charles Darwin. And we need to discover that, and it happens mostly in consciousness and it happens in the development of our sense of self and our values and our capacities. It's not physically obvious, but we are in progress. We're not a finished object. So you get, okay, humans have their own evolution. There's a starting point for a conversation where Steiner has given a lot of useful information. Otherwise you're stuck saying, yeah, even about ourselves. I did a good thing yesterday, I did a bad thing today. Gosh, what am I going to do next? <laughs> but um, yeah, it's we're we're not in a place where people are easily going to say, "Yeah, humanity is a great thing," and say, "We've seen this all before." You start looking, you begin to see some distinctions, like wars were not a problem in the past. That's one thing I think, war, yeah, okay. There was a war, that happened, this happened, a lot of suffering, that just happened. Now we're saying, 
That's bad. We're trying to, we're not stopping wars, but we have the idea that we should. That's new. 120 years so maybe. A little change in consciousness, maybe. A little advanced. Yeah. yeah. And one more in the house and we need to get back to Zoom. I'll turn no, the mic just, just keep, keep going. Um, John, I am I'm troubled by the fact that there seems to be a dichotomy to me between how we can represent this new possibility to say the the younger generation and what anthroposophy has to bring in all. And yet I heard you say Steiner died and is not with us. And so therefore we have to almost, I almost heard you say we have to discount the Christmas conference and the statutes because he's gone. But how does that statement represent this new evolution of consciousness or either, you know, this new perspective that we can hope to bring to renew cultural life. I, I don't accept that myself, that Steiner is not dead. We just are not on the side of the threshold that can observe him. And if we were, we would not treat the Christmas conference in the way that you're describing, I don't think. And that in itself yeah. would have a renewing effect in the movement and then out so it's, i'm glad you brought that up that that you know your sense is rudolf steiner is not dead and the point i was making about the relationship with the statutes and so forth is that he was there giving them and exercising the leadership and spiritual capacity that he had as an incarnate human being and that those statutes and this is what we'll do made a specific sense with him there incarnated without him there incarnated nobody was giving those lectures carl unger tried for a few years and was shot for his troubles um you know things did not hold together and there's a specific problem with the members that Rudolf Steiner wrote about, I didn't want to bring up and I won't now, but um, things change. And for us to hold on so tightly to something from 1923, four, and his writing on into 25 is not the way he operated. So are we going to attach ourselves to done deeds? Or are we going to try to feel the movement of this and other great spirits through incarnation and beyond? It's good to point that out. Because that's where our further capacity is. Some of us are not going to be here in a few years. All of us will not be here at the end of this century, I would guess. All of us in this room. Well, I don't know. But... Understanding is good. Attachment is not so good. And our, our past history of the old mysteries was one of attachment. The light is being lost, right up to 1899, according to Steiner. The light is being lost. You must preserve it the way it was given to you. That's a habit in all of our unconscious insofar as we were involved with those in previous lives. That's another thing to remember. We've been these places. That's another part of the reality we're in now. Steiner would say, this is the karma of your past lives. You're living the results of what you did and failed to do previously. And that again, kind of, oh yeah, really? <laughs> what do I do about that? <laughs> but it expands, it expands the picture. It opens it up. Say, well, okay, I'll take on this part of it. What? Jim, yes, now Jim Yeager is next. Jim, could you uh, unmute your machine, please? 
Sure. Uh, thank you, John, for your uh, all your work on this. Uh, just a couple you're of questions. You're going to repeat it because you're the only one hearing it in this room. Take, take your earphones out. Maybe you can get a computer. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim, please say it again. Yes. Just, just to say, uh, I have two questions. One, you said um, that the movement lacks a strong center. And the other thing is just to, so my question is, uh, you've talked about fundraising, you've talked about uh, outreach and activities. And I just wanna ask, who do you imagine doing all of this? Uh, and then, then the second thing that I have is, um, I've just finished a lot of research on a book that's going to be published in January, and I have about, I'm going to say, 25 uh, different sets of revised bylaws from 1933 up into 2010 for the American Society, in which the vessel of the society has been reshaped uh, according to the impulses of the times and membership participation has been changed. So uh, just to say that there are some real examples of how we got to where we are today um, that uh, are people trying to make sure everyone participates. So that was just a comment. But my question is, how do you imagine uh, the changed leadership under, under what you're imagining, John? Well, first of all, the society is undergoing a tremendous reorganization. We'll have a new general secretary next October. The director of operations step back effectively in September. We have a new director of finance, Eddie Letterman. Um, we have a fairly new director of programs. Um, and I've stepped back as director of communications. So there's a lot of space for ferment and development. And Steiner gave us a lot of pictures of things coming to, let's not call it chaos, uh, but coming to an unformed state where new impulses could meet with what they needed to meet with. Another example is... Uh, what's been called caterpillar soup. I don't know if anybody here has a taste for caterpillar soup. Um, it's not about going and collecting caterpillars and cooking them up in a pot. It's that when a caterpillar um, decides somehow to wrap itself up in a cocoon or a chrysalis, something happens which we don't see and it comes out a different form. And between the one form with a whole bunch of legs and the other form with a couple of big wings and just a few legs, totally different, you wouldn't recognize them, there's a transformation. There's a soup that's created. It remains alive, but the old form dissolves. And they identified actually a long time ago, little cells that seem to do nothing in the caterpillar, which they dubbed imaginal cells, because the, cat, the butterfly form is called technically the imago. It's the final image. And these imaginal cells are just waiting and saying, okay, now it's time to take this form. But it goes through a soup stage. And yeah, Gene, one of the great things that was done along the way and came out of the society, I think you had a big hand in it, was Eric Utney and Chris Bamford putting together an emerging culture. And it was a supplement to Utney Reader or Utney Magazine while it was still, while magazines still had a big influence. And it gave a huge boost to Waldorf and biodynamics in particular. It had a piece on the society, but the society was, from my point of view, still looking inward. So there wasn't something to say, well, come become a member, but it wasn't obvious what the initiative was. 
And I think that's the transformation I'm looking for. We stay in the mode of we're fostering an emerging culture that everyone will be part of. And we can't predefine it, but we've got some inspiring suggestions. So you've been doing it. I'm sure your book will be great. And uh, other people are doing it person by person. It's just that for somebody who's managed three other nonprofit organizations, the Anthroposophical Society in America is the worst funded with the biggest mission. And it kind of deals with that by not fully acknowledging how big that mission might be. And I can understand that because everybody was overworked. And that happens to a lot of nonprofits. But so we're going to have to ask people to volunteer. And I guess I'm doing my little piece here by just putting forward these ideas. I'm in no position to do anything authoritative here, except I have some opinions and I made some PowerPoint slides. And I quoted Rudolf Steiner several times. Want that to be clear. Okay, Lucy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe the people are going to. Yeah, go ahead. Sit down. Trying to figure out this is going to be a question or a comment. Um, so the first question that came to me was. was why, Why am I always sitting, sitting in a room with old people? <laughs> and um, then, then the second, second question or thought that came, came to me was, um, when I meet young people my age, I actually feel that every single thing they talk about has an anthroposophy an answer for it. Um, and, and also that their their aura, their Innate, innate fundamental, fundamental reality is, is more anthroposophical than, than the generation of the older people I'm usually around who are studying anthroposophy. And, and it feels, feels as though young people have incarnated through an anthroposophical texture, texture um, more so than the people who are studying it. So, so it's, it's kind of a disorienting experience, experience because 99% of the people, people I speak anthroposophically with, with are above 50, 50 years old. Um, yet, yet, almost every, every single young person that I meet, I'm like, oh my God, you want anthroposophy. So I'm just wondering why, what was happening in your generation that allowed for so many anthroposophists to be in the rooms that I'm in at your age? And what happened in the time I was born where I barely ever meet one anthroposophist who's even in 10 year range of me. Um, I think answering that question might, might open up some, some insight into what's going on and why it's not moving forward in a generation. So Lucien, could I toss that back to you this way and say, why not simply accept that as how things are and what's the plan? Where do we go with that? You know, older people are inspired by young people. Middle-aged people kind of have to figure out things on their own a bit, but, you know, you look and say, oh, gosh, I was a little bit like that, but, you know, they're smarter. I had better prospects financially. They're making more out of what they've got. I mean... Steiner had this problem in 1923. Young people who wanted to do things, old people who wanted to study, learn things. And it's not insignificant to learn things, but the reaction is a longer term one. And you can try doing things and mess things up a lot. But, you know, this is the situation. This is where we're at. Another factor is that according to Steiner, 
since the end of Kali Yuga, since 1900, people are more and more, let's be very esoterically technical about that, having their etheric bodies, their life formative forces, their organic power loosen from their physical form. And since this etheric power carries thinking, remembering, image forming, and form making, when it gets out beyond our bodies, it can meet that in other humans, in other animals, in plants, in whatever. So, yeah, young people ought to be moving along fast here, and we're trying to keep up with technology and uh, and not let the physical mechanical overrun us. You know, it's very helpful. I love it to death, so to speak. But uh, it's great for new people to be coming along fast, I think. Now, if you have a need in that situation that you can identify that older people could help you with, speak up. You can ask him a direct question. I'm not sure you're asking me. Yeah, you can answer anything, but you got to ask me. Oh, I know. Yeah. What are the young people going to do? Or you <laughs> ask oh, that's a good one. What so? What are these young people going to do? Are they simply going to? Uh, freeze up looking at old people who are getting cranky and creaky and <laughs> or should we be like boy where my imagination goes like the time of Nero and get ourselves uh, dipped in pitch and burnt on columns as witnesses to the uh, fact that physical life isn't the whole of everything that's something we might think of as older people. I'm not volunteering, but there are a lot of possibilities, aren't there? For what? For how this situation can evolve. Mm. I mean, we should be doing anthroposophy on TikTok. I don't know if you do TikTok. TikTok, TikTok is a mess and a problem and an inspiration and a an creative opening. <clears throat> mm -hmm. who said you had to write things in sonnet form but if you did what did you accomplish sometimes by restricting yourself in that way don't get prematurely pessimistic you've got don't you've got every I'm <laughs> not prematurely pessimistic that's what I like. Lucian's father is in the room here, so <laughs> and his mom. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a good point, but it's one that anthroposophists have gotten a little fixated. Oh, the youth are here. Well, yeah, fine. I know I know a number of young people, including you. You're what, 25? 28. 28 already. Oh yeah. gosh. Getting old. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if out of the capacities of older people, we could start turning back out to the world at large. We wouldn't be a drag on your hopes. You may not yet be ready to identify your goals and plans with a lot of specificity, but you want to see us accomplishing things. That's what you want from us. No, I don't, I don't think that... Or at least that's what I wanted from older people when I was 25. No, I'm saying I want something. I think the old people are all doing great. It's the young people that aren't doing anything about anthroposophy. That's my point. The that, young people in anthroposophy. Well, there are no young people in anthroposophy that I know. Oh, well, I think they're 14 or... Yes. <laughs> I'm saying that the old people are doing anthroposophy consciously. The young people are doing it unconsciously and missing the point by not actually doing it consciously because they're not coming to it. So they're getting lost in polarized thinking. They're getting lost in 
materialistic thinking. They're getting lost in um, a, a lot of things that are um, not that are not allowing for living social relationship to happen. Um, that's not based on sympathy or antipathy. And I think that that's why I'm wondering what happened. Why, why are, what hap was happening when you were getting into anthroposophy that allowed for so many older people to be in anthroposophy today that is not happening that when I started to get into anthroposophy, which is now, why was there, why are there so many more older people than younger people in anthroposophy? But there aren't many older people. 4,500 people in the United States when there are 100 million people who believe in reincarnation is way But there's way less sad. young people. Yeah, because the situation, the older people has not gone out much except in schools. And in schools, we're not recruiting people. We're trying to give people a better start than they'll get in a bureaucratized, politicized, underfunded public education system in the United States. So you're saying that the old people, when you were my age, invited you into anthroposophy and they're not doing that to my age now? Well, I found my own way, but people, people, you know, uh, Christopher shared in Ann Arbor at the age of 16, some people he got together with, went through the whole Christmas Foundation meeting, word for word, no comments. That's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Some of these things must be ca karmic, but. But as you mentioned yeah. earlier, we had the new age movement. Hmm. A lot of people went through drugs or Eckhart Carr or yes. you know, different things, and then they wised up a bit and got into anthroposophy. And I think that's where most of the reincarnation came from. Shirley MacLaine. Yeah. No, there's one person. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's about 1 a.m. in London. So, yeah, yeah. This is your turn. Hi. Good evening to all. I uh, two things. I... Two things which are more comments, certainly not question. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you? Can you please yes. uh, be louder? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I put it up to the very top. Yeah, yeah I just, hope just can, top I, I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah. The comment I want to make is about language. And I um, relate to what John said. Uh, perhaps one of the problems that we are having with this generational gap that seems to be incomparable is that we are not talking the same language as the young. We often, I speak for, from my experience, which is based in London, the UK, um, very often, even when we speak with each other, we speak in metaphors of what Steiner has written instead of coming up with something that we have digested and metabolized within ourselves that can give us our individual voice that will reach out. Too often we use quotes and your quotes today, by the way, John, were perfect, but I'm in principle against using quotes because it means that we've only read superficially and repeat without having fully understood what we have read. We just repeat what Steiner said. <clears throat> not only we are not bringing it to nowadays uh, present conditions and situations, we are also depriving ourselves of the opportunity of encountering each other truly. Mm. So that's my basic comment that I, that I wanted to make. And hence, of course, as a consequence of this is the fact that if the youth are feeling the difficulties of interaction with us is our fault. That's all. Now, I don't think I can 
do a very good summary, but yeah, we heard to some extent in the room. It's, it's hard to keep many, many things in mind at once, but one coloration to our situation that I think we should try to keep in mind you know, you, you bring something and people, some people will be overwhelmed in a negative way by it. But if you don't bring it, then there's a question. We're in a time when the development of individualism is of paramount importance. And I think for the Judeo-Christian tradition, you can say that the great commandment, first enunciated by Moses and repeated by Jesus, that you should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. That's not understood because what is God in that? But you follow that back. It's from Moses. Moses asked God for God's name, and a name in those times was your power, and the name was I am that I am. Ehia, asher, ehia. It's not exactly I am, though. It's the power of being an individual. We humans have to realize, we have to make real that power. And that means pushing other people back. Now, to understand anything that anybody else says, you have to let them in. So there's a picture from Steiner of this dynamic. Oh, I want to understand what you're saying. Oh, now back off. There's this push and pull in the encounter with the other. And of course, the language is a great problem. Um, my language from my days on earth is uh, made all the worse by the fact that I grew up with a lot of old books and I read a lot of old authors. And uh, if I didn't watch TikTok, I wouldn't know what's going on. I keep bringing TikTok, but uh, you know, Used to be you couldn't possibly film your rhythmy. Well, we live and learn. But yeah, these are, again, these are the conditions we're living with. What can we do about it? Are we perhaps out of time? No, no, no. We can take well, more time. Yeah, but we have a workshop, at least I have a workshop. 10 in the morning until one and then two until four or five. So, you know. <laughs> uh, no. I, I put my email in the chat, jhbeck23 at gmail.com. And I'm happy to continue email conversing. And I hope people will in the Chicago area, come tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. and tune in on Zoom at 2 p.m. Central U.S. time tomorrow. But this is not something that's, I mean, this is a change of face for me in terms of what I've ever experienced the Anthroposophical Society doing. So it's not something I expect to simply be accepted or taken in and acted on. It's a proposition about what may be possible and what we might want to prioritize in these couple of years of the hundred year cycle of Rudolf Steiner's life. So that's what I can bring. That's also my reconnection to my original intention in 1984 when I met Rudolf Steiner's work. And um, yeah, I'd love for it to resonate. And I would like for it to continue as email conversations, as more discussions. I would like to hear suggestions about what we could do in what format to bring value to particular groups, people 20 to 30, 20 to 28, people over 70, African-Americans. We talk about, you know, African-Americans have a tremendous spirituality. There are a bunch of indigenous spiritualities in North America that we have 
as a society no real connection with. Can you give your email again? Yeah. J H Beck two three J H B E C K two three at gmail.com. Hey, you're gonna get a lot of comments. Well I hope so and I'm we'll be really looking forward to staying in touch and do connect tomorrow and um, I think at the end of December I may be back on the front range anthroposophical cafe what a concept front range is mountains in Colorado and suddenly it's a global presence as these programs are which <clears throat> again thank you Andre and uh, thank you Mary thank the Chicago branch and it really is a beautiful meeting room. I wish everyone could see it. I'm sitting in front of this Gertianum window reproduction of thinking. I don't know where that's. Yeah. Dear, Dear friends, friends, I think it's time to say thank, thank you, you so much, much John, for your beautiful, beautiful presentation, presentation and slides. And, and uh, uh, dear friends, friends, feel free to unmute your, your machine and, and uh, uh, greet John, John and say thank, thank you. you. Um, lecture, lecture will be recorded. Lecture, lecture is recorded and posted on our website. Mm -hmm. So, the next presentation is tomorrow, and I promise to improve our technical stuff. So, no more echo. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to everyone. Everyone. Yes. Thank you. Everyone. I uh, you so think when you are up so late. That's Thank one you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's only three o'clock in the morning here. Oh, yeah. Oh my God. No, no, no. Wait for a second. Good luck for tomorrow. Three o'clock is wonderful. Tomorrow, another time. See you later. You know. I